Community Trust News Center. This is the News Hour. On News Hour tonight, curfew imposed as gunmen kill 17 in fresh attacks in Kaduna village. Police rescue 14 kidnapped victims after spending 68 days in captivity. Serap tackles federal government over threats to shut down broadcast stations. And on the foreign scene, watchdog clears South Africa's Ramaphosa in cover-up scandal. Hello and welcome to Trust TV's News Hour. I am Ibrahim Youssef. We begin with matters of security uh, following an attack that left 10 people and a police officer dead. The Kaduna State Government has imposed a 24-hour curfew in four communities in Zangwankataf local government area. Special Assistant to the Executive Chairman, Zangwankataf Local Government Council, Yabo Chris Ephraim, in a statement said the curfew was to allow soldiers to restore peace to the area. Recall that a police officer and 10 others lost their lives on Saturday night following an attack by suspected terrorists. This comes barely 72 hours after a pastor's son was shot dead while four others were abducted in the Karimbu Kahugu community in Liri local government area of the state. Earlier, we spoke to Trust TV's Bella Musa, who gives us an update on the situation. Uh, the government has stormed the communities on Saturday evening, uh, shooting sporadically in the air and burning houses at Ngwenwakili in Zangwan Katap local government area uh, in the southern part of Kaduna State. Uh, uh, after the attack, about 10 corpses have been uh, discovered uh, by the locals uh, in the area. Uh, the Zangwan Katap local government and authority in a statement earlier imposed a uh, 24 hour curfew at uh, Ungwer Wakili, uh, Ungwer Juju, Ungwer Mabuhu, and also Zangwan, uh, Zango urban area. Uh, the extension in the air in the affected communities and people in those communities are mourning because of the loss of their loves, loved ones and also uh, they are living in fear presently. Uh, uh, the mass burial of the victims uh, is presently ongoing in the areas. Uh, also, uh, in, the, in the statement uh, the issued by the special assistant to chairman of Zengwa Katap local government area, uh, Mr. Yabo uh, Chris, uh, said the curfew uh, imposed in the area is to allow military and other security agencies in the area to restore peace and in the, in the area. Uh, uh, also, uh, when contacted, uh, the police public relations officer of Kaduna State Command and DSP Mohammed Jalinge in a WhatsApp chat confirmed the attack, saying that uh, the brief from the briefing uh, he received from the area commander in the southern Kaduna, Azix, the trouble started a uh, few days ago when a boy uh, rearing a cattle was murdered uh, in the area. Uh, he said the police was investigating the occurrence before uh, trouble broke out in the area. Uh, that is from to yesterday to today. Uh, he said the police is on top of the situation. Uh, he also said uh, uh, if not for the intervention of the joint security personnel in the area, uh, the attackers or the hoodlums will have done more damage in the areas. Meanwhile, fear has great residents of Kubwa, a suburb of Abuja, after gunmen attacked Chikakori Estate where they abducted about 10 people on Friday. Kabir Lawal speaks to residents on their harrowing experiences. An eyewitness said the kidnappers came in through the back of the estate, shooting sporadically. Said the abducted residents, including the pastor, are still in captivity. Um, at about midnight, the wife just came knocking on, the, on our gate. Where well, well, she's the one? Initially, I was hesitating. Say maybe it's the arm robbers that brought her. Mm. But I say even if it's arm robbers, I have to risk my myself. Mm. I took that risk and went out, opened the, the door, the gate. Then then she came in and said, they've taken everybody. I said, I bet I thought it's even an arm robbery issue. He said, no, no, that they abducted everybody in the in the house, even the opposite, their own. They were all going. 
There's this place, the place they broke through the, the railway fence and our fence. That's where they, they took them through a dish and they marched they march them into the bush. The eyewitness further explained that the gunmen broke the gates to force their way inside the estate, adding that they threw their victims into a ditch before taking them into the bush. Then um, after a while, I now decided to post it on our platform as the residents. Then they started making comments, let's call police, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. Someone said they has called the police station, the Kuba police, that the police will soon be here. Then after a while, I decided, they called me again that they were at his gate, trying to break into the house. I posted it again because at that point I stopped calling him, that you know, attract their attention. Then as we were waiting for the police, I kept on updating them what was happening. After a point, I decided to call, and his number was not going on. It was not going, was not going again. Uh, the government is not doing their work, and they know all those people. Now, if somebody knows, cannot small more money for somebody now, they say, hey, this one is a, is a thief. But you know where all of them are. Can you believe that? Okay, we have, we have flights that are moving. So, are you, are, you, are, you believe, are you trying to tell me that now that the fight, the fraud is flights now, they're not seeing what is happening in the, the whole world, especially Nigeria flights? My brother is not good. Let Nigeria work and let the new government, I believe that there's a new government that's coming now and God will do it. He said security operatives came blaring siren after the gunmen left the scene. Other residents that spoke to Trust TV News called on the government to do the needful to secure their release and end frequent cases of abduction. Kabir Lowell, Trust TV News, Abuja. And now to Zamfara State, where the police command has dislodged a bandit's camp and rescued 14 kidnapped victims who had spent 68 days in captivity. This is contained in a statement issued in Guso on Saturday by the police public relations officer in the state, SP Mohammed Shihu. According to him, police tactical operatives, in conjunction with the vigilante group, while on a mop up operation near Munghaye Forest, successfully dislodged some bandit camps belonging to a bandit kingpin, popularly known as Dogo Sule. The victims informed the police detectives that on the 1st of January 2023, at about 11 p.m., a large number of suspected bandits armed with sophisticated weapons stormed Ngwer Mangoro and Gidam Maidawa villages in Kusawa local government area and abducted the victims to their camp where they spent 68 days in captivity. He said the state commissioner, police Kolo Yusuf, has congratulated the victims for regaining their freedom and reassured the command's continuous commitment to protect lives and property of citizens. And now to the war on drugs, where a rehabilitated ex Boko Haram fighter, Alai Madu, and the traditional ruler of Kajola, a border community between Ondu and Edo states, Bale Akinola Adebayo, are among 37 persons arrested over 2.2 tons of illicit drugs seized by the operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency at the Mutsala Muhammad International Airport, Ikeja, Lagos, and in raids across 12 states in the past week. The statement by the Director, Media and Advocacy, NDLEA Headquarters, Abuja, Femi Baba Femi, said as part of ongoing operations to mop up illicit drugs across the country, Ahead of the next round of elections, NDLA officers stormed Kajola Forest where they destroyed three cannabis farms measuring over 39.8 hectares. The owner of the farms, who claims to be the Bale of Kajola, Akinola Adebayo, was arrested while two other suspects, believed to be his workers, Arikueri Abdurrahman and Habibu Olugun, were also nabbed in a hut near the farms. In the same vein, a 26-year-old ex-Boko Haram fighter, Alai Madu, who worked for the group for 15 years before he surrendered to the Nigerian military in 2021, was intercepted by NDLA operatives on Thursday, the 9th of March, along Abuja Kaduna Expressway with 10 kilograms of skunk, which he said he bought in Ibadan, Oyo State, and was taking the consignment concealed in a sack to Maiduguri. The statement said Madu, a native of Banki town in Borno state, joined the notorious terrorist organization in 2006 when he was nine years old. 
Madhu said he repented and surrendered to the military in 2021, after which he underwent rehabilitation and de-radicalization processes at the Umaru Shehu Rehabilitation Center, Maiduguri, and Marlon Sidi De-radicalization Center, Gombe, before he was discharged after spending six months. Thereafter, he traveled to Ibadan, Oyo State, where he worked as a commercial motorcycle rider before going into drug trafficking and his eventual arrest along Abuja Kaduna Expressway. The Delta State Police Command has confirmed the assault on a police officer by officers of the Nigerian Navy in a trending video on social media. In the 1 minute 30 second clip, an assaulted officer was seen moving about restlessly inside the premises of the police station with angry colleagues appealing, appearing to calm him down. The incident happened at NRM police station near Wari. The unidentified officer's face was bloodied and his police uniform was partially torn. Efforts to get the reaction of the military authorities in the state proved abortive as no official was willing to comment on the issue. But the Delta State Police Public Relations Officer, Bright Edafe, confirmed the incident in a telephone conversation. According to the police spokesperson, the incident occurred at the NRM police station in the Wari area. He also assured that the matter has been handled by the top officials of the police command and the Nigerian Navy. Meanwhile, a resident of Halliru Street of just north local government area of Plateau State, Ibrahim Naziru, has accused the police personnel of arresting and brutalizing him without any cogent reason. Naziru explained that he was tortured and subjected to inhuman treatment, causing injuries to his body. He is calling on the relevant authority to take action against his maltreatment. Adou Musa completes the story. February 21st this year will ever remain in the memory of Naziru. This is so because of the physical and mental torture he allegedly experienced in the hands of police. While narrating his ordeal on Sunday, the victim said the degree of punishment inflicted on him while he was at the metro police station in Panteka area of Kaduna State could have led to his death. Naziru, who described his arrest and detention as illegal, Explain how the police whisked him away from Plateau to Kaduna State. Sunana Naziri Ibrahim. My name is Naziru Ibrahim, residing along Haliru Street. On February 21st, when I was about to open the gate of my house, a group of people suddenly approached me and said I was under arrest. I asked them to allow me to inform my wife, but refused. I also asked them to allow me to inform my relatives and associates, but refused. They forced me into their bus and drove to Kaduna and eventually arrived at Metro Police Station in Panteka area of Kaduna State. Asked if the police had told him his offense before subjecting him to punishment, the victim has this to say. Before you know anything on our arrival, they tie me up and put slabs and tires on my back and asked to explain my life from the age of seven to death. They subjected me to all kinds of punishment and maltreatment for an offense I don't know and never know. The punishment resulted to injuries over my body. The victim father asked Inspector General of Police to investigate his maltreatment and bring perpetrators to book. I call on the relevant authority, especially the IG, to do the needful, to ensure that those officers who inflicted the injuries on me and subjected me to severe punishment do not go free. This will serve as a deterrent to others. The victim father called on security agency to first ensure one is guilty of an offense before taking action against them. Ado Musa, Trust TV News, Joss. And the Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, is not happy with the federal government's threat to shut down broadcast stations. Last week, the government, through the National Broadcasting Commission, said it will shut down broadcast stations found culpable of using their platforms to undermine the peaceful coexistence of Nigeria. Following a meeting between NBC's Director General Balarabi Ilila and broadcast stations on the coverage of the February 25th presidential and national assembly elections, 
The Commission said it will not hesitate to revoke the license of broadcasters threatening the peace of the country. But in a statement on Sunday, Sarap urged President Mahmoud Buhari to instruct the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, and the National Broadcasting Commission to urgently withdraw the last warning and threat to revoke the licenses of broadcast stations and shut them down over coverage of the elections and post-election matters. And to politics now. With the postponement of the governorship and state houses of assembly elections, many political parties have intensified their campaigns, while some collapse their structures to join others. In Adamawa, the weak extension creates a chance for the two leading political parties, headed by Governor Ahmadou Umaru and Senator Aisha Tubinani, to receive defectors to their camps. Salis so Law has the report. The one-week extension of the election by the Independent National Electoral Commission has provided an opportunity for the parties to make further effort to win the hearts of the masses. It will be recalled the Labour Party governorship candidate in Adamawa, Umar Mustafa, joined the All Progressive Congress to help its candidate win the election. Few days later, People's Democratic Party Central Zone aspirant Abu Bakr Ibrahim Gombi also joined the Binani scam. The board call on their supporters to unite and ensure victory is for Binani. I am specifically saying all my supporters, all means all, all my supporters should come out and mass and vote for Senator Aisha to have it in Binani. It has always been my desire for this, my uh, brother, from my uncle, For APM, Abga, NRM, ZLP, ADP, and APP governorial candidates, moving to Governor Ahmad Umar of Interest come is best choice. While on his part, the Adamawa State Action Alliance governorial candidate, Suleiman Tahir, vehemently debunked rumors going round of his stepping down for Governor Ahmad Umar of Intre. And I hereby state vehemently unequivocally that I'm still in the race for the governorship of Adamawa State and I will never and I have no intention whatsoever to align with any other party. Now both APC's Aisha Tubinani and Governor Ahmadu Umar of Intri of the People's Democratic Party have been visibly involved in the campaign in several places including churches, markets and streets trying to woo as many voters as possible. Silas Lewin, Trust TV News, Yola. And now to Katsada State, where political alignment is getting intense in the state ahead of next Saturday's governorship and state assembly elections. Abdullahi Ahmadi reports that some political parties are aligning or merging with the two major political parties in the state to either retain or wrestle power. It is obvious that the PDP and the APC are the major political parties struggling to make it to Muhammad Buhari House come March 18th. <laughs> Though the People's Redemption Party, PRP, is curiously following the turn of events with keen interest, having presented a credible person who many believed is in the contest to win the election. The three candidates of PRP, PDP, and APC continue to re-strategize to bridge all gaps ahead of the next Saturday's elections. Part of these strategies is how APC was able to persuade a faction of PDP under the former governor Ibrahim Shema to support Dikorada during the next Saturday's elections. In the same vein, Chieftains of NNPP and Accord Party collapsed their structures to support the ruling APC in Kasama State. Democracy, the alliance, the 
we at the NNPP were into this alliance with the governorship candidate of APC, Dr. Diko Umarada, to support him win the next Saturday's election. Kazuna State requires an educated person to take it to the next level. That is why we support Dr. Diko Umarada and he will win the next Saturday's election. God willing. <laughs> Similarly, the Labour Party just recently collapsed all its structures in support of the PDP governorship candidate, Senator Yakubu Ladu Damariki. After thorough deliberation, discussions and consultations, we were able to come up with distinguished Senator Yakubu Ladu Damariki of the People's Democratic Party as the best candidates for the forthcoming election in Kazina State. Democracy gives room for multi-party system. But that the campaign teach or try to show that we want to become a one-party system, especially here in Kazina. So that one-party system does not help the, uh, the, uh, the democracy. Does not help. But if you want uh, so progress, or if you want uh, benefited more from the government. So there is need for us to have a opposition. This is coming at a time the APC and the PDP are trading words, accusing another of planning to rig the forthcoming elections in the state. Abdullahi Ismayamadi, Crossed Television News, Kazana. And still talking politics, the Accord Party in Oyo State has inaugurated a new state executive council just six days to the governorship elections on Saturday. The national leadership of the party has dissolved the former state executive council after they openly endorsed Governor Shea Maikinde of the People's Democratic Party as the preferred governorship candidate instead of the party's candidate Adebayo Adelabu. The national leadership of the party on Sunday inaugurated a five-man caretaker committee led by Isiaka Salami, condemning the action of the former state executives. National legal advisor of the party said it was shameful for a group of people to constitute themselves against the decision of the party, promising to sanction them according to the party provisions. The party's governorship candidate, Adebayo Adelabu, said the betrayal was not unexpected but never acceptable, expressing shock that some individuals could turn to political jobbers for selfish gains. They are the okay. It has happened like that. Our federal candidate lost because of Ashiwaju tsunami. Yes. Not because they were not popular, not because they were not competent, not because they did not spend money, not because they did not campaign. After the election, these people sold us out. Yes. They sold us out. I will not be specific because I was not there. The one who make a party chairman who never attended our campaign. Did he attend our campaign? No. I am not here on my own. I am standing before you on the authority of the National Working Committee of Accord and the, our national chairman. They sent me to let people know that the actions of the previous ESCO of Accord is completely condemnable. Of course, solidly stand behind our candidate. Not only the commercial candidate, but all candidates contesting the election under accord in your state. All I have said is that we have a task, daunting task, before us. And that task is to work for Mr. Adebayo Adelabu to win this election. Amen. There is no two ways for any political man or any politician. All you want to hear is that we voted and we won. And now to Zamfara State, where some residents of Guso, the state capital, have continued to react to the rescheduling of the 2023 governorship and state House of Assembly elections by the Independent National Electoral Commission. According to them, the development had disrupted their plans. And they want the Commission to perfect its plans to ensure early arrival of officials at the various polling units so that the exercise could commence at the scheduled time.
the report. Residents of Goso Metropolis have expressed their sadness over the rescheduling of the 2023 governorship and assembly election to 18th March 2023 by the Independent National Electoral Commission INEC when they already planned to troop out last Saturday to vote for candidates of their choice. Musa Umar, who is a civil society activist based in Zamfara State, called on the commission to ensure people who have the capacity to operate the Biomodial Voters Accreditation System Beavers be allowed to use the machine in the governorship and the state assembly elections so as to avoid the challenges faced in the last presidential and national assembly elections. He advised INEC to fine-tune their preparation to ensure early commencement of the election in order not to keep voters for longer hours at the polling booths. If you have 50 as a figure, for example, 20 people voted, let's see 20 if there is invalid, let's but the issue of election summary sheet results, but there are some of them that you even see that you know that this is not really something that one could accept and so on. So please talk to your staff. Let us have a clean copy of the election summary results. What is this figure for? What is that for? Suleiman Abubakar and Abdul Balarabi, who are voters, said they were eager to vote for the candidates of their choice, but their hopes were shattered by the postponement of the governorship and the state assembly elections. They called on the commission to fulfill its promise to Nigerians that the 2023 general elections will be conducted with the use of bimodal voters accreditation system beavers and results transmitted electronically to INEC result viewing portals. In the last election, they said if the, the election is going to be an electronic election and the transmission of results, but it turned out none of that happened in the elections. So we expect this one to be has to be us to be to be electronically vote, voted and electronically transmitted to the server. But if it happens to be not like that, that's why I'll be very disappointed. Because they have of no use to perform the election if they know it's not going to be as they told us to be. So use the results sent to them through the, the their portal. Because there there are many agitations that people said uh, this election was uh, was not how the chairman said it was it is going to be conducted. They urged the electorate not to be discouraged with the rescheduling of the governorship and the state assembly elections, but they should come out to vote for candidates whom they believe are credible, are competent to govern them. And still talking about the fallout of the postponed elections, several universities have extended their resumption dates for academic activities. The Independent National Electoral Commission had announced a one-week delay of the elections earlier scheduled for March 11th for reconfiguration of the bimodal voter accreditation system machines used during the Presidential and National Assembly elections two weeks ago. In separate notices, students and staff of several universities were informed of the new resumption of academic activities. So with us on Trust TV's News Hour, still ahead. We take a look at protection of public infrastructure. Whose responsibility is it? Details of this and more after the break. Do stay with us.
Welcome back and thanks for staying with us on Trust TV News Hour. Now let's take a little look at our top stories. Curfew imposed as gunmen kill 17 in fresh Kaduna village attack. And police rescue 14 kidnapped victims after spending 68 days in captivity. And moving on to other news. The Ariwa Consultative Forum has warned that continuous disobedience to the Supreme Court judgment regarding the use of the old Nara notes could lead to the breakdown of law and order. In a statement, ACF Secretary General Murtala Aliu agreed with the state governors who sued the federal government over the policy. He said the current approach of the Central Bank of Nigeria raises concerns about the respect for the civil liberties and rights of Nigerians as it relates to their freedom to use legitimately earned income as they so wish. He argued that whatever the CBN or anyone else says about the benefits of the policy, which evidently are many, is of little comfort as the highest court in the country has deemed that it is, or at least the manner of its implementation breaches the law. He however lamented the huge crowds and long queues formed around bank offices and ATM points across the country as people struggle to get the new cash, which has remained extremely scarce and has triggered riots and other forms of civil unrest. Meanwhile, the Balsa state government on Saturday called on the Central Bank of Nigeria to respect the judgment of the Supreme Court and ease hardships of citizens caused by the new NARA policy. The government also appealed for calm amidst the challenges faced by Nigerians following the NARA redesign and cashless policy introduced by the CBN. The government made the call in a statement issued by the State Commissioner for Information, Orientation and Strategy, Chief Aibaina Duba, following protests by residents of the state over the policy. It appreciated the pains of the residents caused by the implementation of the narrow redesign policy and the Supreme Court ruling on the old 200, 500 and 1000 Naira currency notes. It urged the CBN to clarify the validity of the old narrow notes being reissued by banks after the Supreme Court order. And as the rainy season approaches, youth in Benue have been urged to engage in agriculture to earn a livelihood and assist in boosting Nigeria's economy. Jimmy Azandi reports that residents believe farming is a big business and should not be taken for granted. His report. It is the season of politics in Nigeria as political parties and supporters across board tighten up for the governorship election on Saturday the 18th. However, experts in the agricultural sector want youths across the country to own farms for their benefits and the growth of the economy. And my call to youths is that we need to join hands together to build the economy of this nation. It's not just about politics. When the politicians are doing their own, the youths also have to be equipped to support the policies. Governments and business owners or entrepreneurs come together to massively encourage the economy. So we are calling you to come into the agricultural sector. This season is almost upon us. Let them get farmlands. There are inputs, there are many credit facilities that can encourage and help them to carry out the farming. So that at the end of the season, you have something to show for themselves, for their community and for the nation as well. Others said with agricultural produce, the youth can feel their families after politicking. Instead of stepping from political masters, the youth are advised to seek for agricultural incentives from the political leaders to engage in large-scale farming. My advice to young people is that they should go back to farm because uh, this is the time for, for farming and we need the young people. In the farm we need the young people more than the way the politicians they need them because after politics we have to eat. So we need to take them back to farm so that they'll be able to produce what even the politicians they will eat. If youth happens to know the value of farming, they will know that even the politician depends on this farming. The reason why you are following politicians should be that this politician may help you, assist you in getting farm inputs, assist you in making policies that will be favorable for you to farm. The experts maintain 
that the economic benefits of farming are enormous and should be taken serious by both the government and the youth population. I told the young coming youth that there is no business that can give you money like farming. Politics is a waste of time to myself. I believe in farming more than any other business because there is no business that will give you what farm will give you as far as I'm concerned. There have been calls for food security in Benue State, reputed as a food basket of the nation. The experts said more hands are needed to mitigate the food shortage last farming season caused by flood disaster in Benue amongst other states in the country. Medical, Dental and Pharmacy Students Association of Nigeria have decried lack of support from governments, saying the attitude of the government towards students also contributes to brain drain in the country's health sector. To this end, the National President, Medical, Dental and Pharmacy Students Association of Nigeria, Adamawa Chapter, Muhammad Abdul Hamid, has appealed to governments to assist the students. Once again, Sadis Lord has the report. Universities across Nigeria have continued to face funding issues, which has continued to be a serious hindrance to access to quality education in the country. Aside from the high tuition fee, these students are worried over lack or insufficient support from the government. They also raised concern over lack of modern methods and gadgets for teaching and learning, saying these are lacking in many public universities in Nigeria. The school fees of universities around 2006 2007, the students who are currently collecting can actually pay that school fees. But the problem now is that those figures remain stagnant for about two decades now. They have not changed at all. And the cost of everything has changed the cost of food, cost of books, you know, medical, how expensive medical books can be. Also, the, apart from the school fees, the books, transport, everything has skyrocketed. So that money that was given with the best of intentions, which was quite impactful in the past and we really appreciate, today it has lost its value. According to them, this is held week, highlighted problem medical students face and appeal for government intervention. I uh, feel necessary, I feel duty bound to call upon the government to please uh, consider our plea and uh, put into consideration uh, the reviewing of the salary scale of the bond agreement we had with the state government is that it's so nobody will ever tell you that it's easy it's not an easy task but with determination with um hard working and dedication everything will go on smoothly stakeholders say decline in the amount of money pumped into universities by governments has given rise to backwardness in the quality of education leaving some universities with no option than high intuition fees Silas Lowen, Trust TV News, Yola. Now, it is the responsibility of government to provide infrastructure to make life meaningful for its citizens. It is equally the citizens' responsibility to protect the infrastructure to provide for their welfare. However, people often vent their anger by destroying public infrastructure. Kabirilo speaks to Abuja residents on whose responsibility it is to protect public facilities. Provision of public infrastructure is the sole responsibility of government. But citizens vandalize public facility like electrical installations, rail track, or manhole for selfish reasons. A cross section of people that spoke to Trust TV News said the destruction of public property can be attributed to ignorance, hunger, poverty, and frustration. My advice is to the young people, please, no matter what, we shouldn't resort to violence. Let's not destroy public properties, be it government or private. Please, there are better ways to, channels our, uh, to channel our grievances. So it is better with dialogue than destruction because it will still cost us to recover from those destructions. Government does not respect the rule of law and we don't think you don't you don't expect any common youth out there to come and respect your own rule that you don't respect the rule of law. Me on my own I always talk about um I, I, I look at the positive ends of things a lot. You understand me? But government of today does not know if the youth are existing or not. You understand? Imagine if you can call the president of Nigeria to come to court and he said nothing like court. 
uh, the, 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 the Supreme Court will give judgment based on our Naira to be, to, 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 to be legal and uh, the government will say nothing. So we don't respect rule of law, so we don't expect anybody to respect the government. Some said the youth should channel grievances through the appropriate authority and not to resort to destruction or looting of public property. Do the right thing. No job. All our, all our foreign jobs are recruiting to Ghana. Everything, mobile, Toyota. Oh, Ghana, so what are we doing? Uh, this is not far from the reality of the changing climate and uh, the heat wave. In all of this make people to behave differently. Uh, let's stay calm and uh, trust something better will happen in the nearest uh, future. Respondents implore the youths to be vanguard of public assets, calling on government to provide job opportunities for them to be more productive. Kabir Lowell, Trust TV News, Abuja. Well, still watching Trust TV's News Hour. The news continues after this break. Just stay with us. Documenting the Nigerian story. Welcome back to Trust TV's News Hour. We'll now take a look at the foreign scene where South Africa's anti corruption watchdog has cleared President Cyril Ramaphosa of any wrongdoing in a preliminary report into a cover up scandal that has tarnished his reputation, according to local media reports. The public prosecutor said it has notified implicated parties of the preliminary finding of its probe over the theft of large amounts of cash from Ramaphosa's luxury Fala Fala farm, something the president is accused of having attempted to conceal. Ramaphosa's spokesman, Vincent Mawenya, said the president received the report, details of which have been leaked to local media. 
The scandal, which erupted in June, involved about 500,000 US dollars in cash that Ramaphosa acknowledged were stolen from beneath sofa cushions at his ranch. Meanwhile, Angola said on Saturday it will send military units to the Democratic Republic of Congo after a ceasefire it brokered between rebel militiamen and the government troops collapsed. DR Congo's restive east has witnessed a flare-up in violence since a militia called M23 took up arms again in late 2021, going on to capture swaths of territory. Angola has played a mediator role in the conflict, but the latest ceasefire it negotiated collapsed on Tuesday, on the same day it was due to take effect. On Saturday, the country's presidency says that it will send a unit of its armed forces to its northern neighbor. This unit's main objective is to secure the areas where the members of the M23 are stationed and to protect members of a team tasked with monitoring compliance of the ceasefire, the presidency said in a statement. Luanda said the decision was taken after consultations with Kinshasa adding that other regional leaders, as well as the United Nations, had been informed. The deployment needs approval from Parliament, where the ruling party, which has been in power since the 1970s, holds a comfortable majority. No further details about the size of the force were immediately available. The move comes as fierce fighting was reported near the eastern city of Goma, which is increasingly threatened by M23 rebels. And Cyclone Freddy has hit Mozambique for a second time in two weeks, killing at least one person, ripping rooftops off houses and prompting a lockdown in one port town, according to a local resident and media. It was the second time the cyclone has struck Mozambique since it was named after being spotted near Indonesia on February 6th. At least 27 people died the last time the storm pummeled the region. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs said Freddy made landfall in Mozambique in the Kolimani district of the central Zambezia province as a tropical cyclone. It said there was a high risk of flooding in Zambezia and neighboring Nampula province, adding that water levels at several river basins were already above the alert level. State broadcaster TVM said one person died when his house collapsed and that the power utility has switched off the electricity completely as a precaution. Iran has announced more than 100 arrests nationwide over the mystery poisonings of thousands of schoolgirls, charging that the unidentified alleged perpetrators may have links with hostile groups. In the wave of cases since late November, schoolgirls have suffered fainting, nausea, shortness of breath, and other symptoms after reporting unpleasant odors on school premises, with some being treated in hospital. State media reported late on Saturday that the Interior Ministry had announced the arrests over the suspected poison attacks in more than 200 schools, which have sparked fear and anger among pupils and their parents. Among those arrested are people with hostile motives and with the aim of instilling terror in the people and students and to close schools. The ministry added that from the middle of last week, the number of incidents in the schools has decreased significantly and there have been no reports of sick students. The statement pointed out possible links to an Albania-based exiled Iranian opposition group that Tehran considered a terrorist organization known as the People's Mujahideen of Iran. And now for a look at sports. Britain's Lee Wood has said he wants to invoke a rematch clause against Mauricio Lara for a fight this summer. Wood was stopped by Lara last month, which saw the Mexican crowned WBA featherweight champion at Motorpoint Arena in Nottingham. Wood and Lara have been linked with a possible fight against former two-time world IBF featherweight champion Josh Warrington. Lara has faced Warrington twice, viciously stopping him in 2021, before a second fight was brought to a halt because of a cut to the Mexican's head. Matchroom promoter Eddie Hearn represents Wood and Warrington 
and could pursue a third fight between Warrington and Lara. Meanwhile, Ireland's Katie Taylor will bid to become a two-weight undisputed world champion when she takes on England's Chantelle Cameron in Dublin on May 20th. The meeting with world light heavyweight welterweight champion Cameron at the Three Arena will be the first professional fight in Ireland for Taylor. The Dubliner challenged Cameron to the fight on Instagram earlier this month. She said she will be happy to move up in weight and has now got her wish. Taylor, the undisputed lightweight champion, was set to face Amanda Serrano in a world title rematch on May 20th, but the Puerto Rican pulled out because of injury. Now, before we go, here is a kicker. Now, these refugees are healing their wounds and the planet by planting, planting trees in the Tombogara refugee camp in Zimbabwe. They also have long-term plans to establish a public park. Let's take a look. I have been here for so long, since 2000 now, and here is now like my home. And why can't I just start thinking to see how we have to make it a better place to live? And uh, that is why I come with the idea, because uh, um, even when I was younger, since I was younger, I was just thinking how I have to do good things for the society. We plant the tree while the tree is growing up. What we do also, we make sure that also we put our vegetable beans uh, because we also have the objective of fighting against poverty. My parents was died when I was 13. I have the opportunity of healing my wound. And when I have the opportunity of healing my wound, that is what I choose also to heal the planet. I'm working because uh, if I try to make this place green and the trees grow, it might help the next generation. Yeah, they might be in a place where there's no more temperature, high temperatures. When we are talking about climate change, in Tongo Gara, you can feel it live. Because other places you may find there is a cooler trees, whatever, but here in Tongo Gara, you can feel it. And uh, sometimes it's also difficult for us to, to breathe because it's too hot. Even in our abscess in Tongogara, this will show that we were there. This is our presence. So planting a tree is like planting a spirit. And with that, we wrap up Trust TV's News Hour for tonight. Don't forget, for more news, you can subscribe to watch us live on YouTube and follow us across all our social media platforms. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. Have a good evening.
Daily Trust News Center. This is the News Hour.